everybody. Welcome to the webinar today. Thanks everybody for signing up and joining and sharing it with your friends. Uh, we have a neat topic today. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about uh, advanced aggregation in SQL. And uh, this topic is pretty cross-platform. So um, regardless of what database platform you work on, uh, this should be useful. There will be a small caveat at the end if you're a DB2 for ZOS person, um, but uh, we'll, uh, most of what we talk about will be uh, pretty cross-platform in nature. So uh, glad everybody could come uh, and uh, feel free to uh, share these with your friends and uh, the replay will be available uh, in the next day or so. Um, my name is David Simpson. You see my email address on the board. Uh, as always, you can feel free to use that to interact. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Themis Training. Keep up with uh, what's, uh, what's going on with us, and we'll publish you know, where more of these webinars become available. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, if you'd like the slides for today's webinar, uh, or to look at upcoming or past webinars that, uh, uh, that we have uh, posted the playbacks for um, about three quarters of the way down your screen there, uh, themasync.com slash webinars. The slides for today's webinar are posted there right now, uh, so you can download them. Um, and uh, lots, of, lots of goodies from uh, previous webinars. Uh, we've been doing these for about the last, um, oh gosh, four years now. Uh, on a pretty regular basis, and so the replays from all the past ones are out there, uh, as well as the slides. Uh, there's also a couple of upcoming ones um, that uh, you can sign up for as well. Um, so uh, feel free to take a look at that. Um, so uh, you know a little bit about our sponsor, right? Themis is uh, IT training. We do a pretty comprehensive uh, curriculum in Oracle, Java, .NET, uh, Linux, Unix, DB2, all kinds of things. Um, this is me, right? Uh, I've been doing uh, SQL since, uh, oh gosh, about 1991 uh, in one form or another. i uh, worked uh, with large database platforms since about 1993. Um, my focus historically has been on DB2, um, but I also do now quite a bit of SQL Server and uh, dabble in the other ones as well. So uh, um, that's kind of where I've been coming from. Uh, down at the bottom there are places you can find me. So themasync.com is um, uh, my company's website. And uh, at themasdave is, is me on Twitter. At themastraining is the company. And uh, on the right side there, you can find um, you know, some of my work at both the webinars page uh, from the Themis website, um, but also on the iDug content blog. I'm a pretty regular contributor uh, to that site as well. And actually, um, you'll see a link in the slides in a little bit where one of the things we're going to talk about is fleshed out a little bit more um, in an iDug content article that I wrote back in April. Um, so uh, lots of free content out there. Both of those links on the bottom right there uh, are, are content that is uh, completely free to the public. On the iDug site, some of the later articles, you do have to create an account to be able to view the full article, but uh, it's, they, are, they are free. You just uh, need, to, need to sign in or create a free account. So I'd encourage you to check out both of those for more information and um, more free content, right? So uh, today we're going to look at, um, uh, well, I've called this advanced aggregation, right? So we're focusing on um, the aggregate functions in SQL. There's five of those that we use with any regularity anyway, uh, and those are things like sum, min, max, average, and count. Um, but really to, uh, and the, the uh, use of those things is pretty straightforward. 
Um, you know, if I want to get a, you know, a sum of a list of a column of values, I can use the sum function and it just adds up the values in that column. Um, we're going to try and go a little bit deeper today, though, and find some, uh, some uh, additional uses of those functions. But to do that, actually, we have to start with the OLAP functions, um, which introduces uh, some extensions that we can put on the end of these functions. And then we'll, uh, we'll translate that into um, what I guess we'll call OLAP specifications on the regular aggregate functions, meaning sum, min, max, average, and count. And then we'll take a look at a specific use case of the lead and lag functions um, in SQL. So uh, let's start with uh, the rank function. So the rank function is, uh, exists to be able to rank um, things uh, you know, according to a particular value. So the, here you see I'm looking at a generic employee table. I'm selecting department number, last name, and salaries. So this is a list of employees and their salaries. <clears throat> and I want to rank them by salary. Um, what you can see here is uh, we've got a couple of, of uh, OLAP specifications there in that over clause. So the rank function itself doesn't take in any arguments. But it expects this, this additional clause, this OLAP specification, which can contain um, a partition by, an order by, or both. And here you're seeing an example of both. So whenever I rank something, I have to tell it, well, how, how am I ranking these people? You know, who's number one? Is it the person with the lowest name alphabetically or the person with the highest salary? And, and here I'm doing that in two ways in that over OLAP specification. I'm saying partition by department number and also order by salary descending. So that partition by says that I'm only, I want to rank, I want to start the rank over at each new value for department number. So you see the, the four people in department A00 at the top. Right, and we ranked them one through four. And then there was only one guy in department B01, and then there were three people in department C01, and we ranked them one through three. And that ranking was, was controlled or specified by the, uh, that over OLAP specification, partition by department number, and then within department number, order by salary descending. Okay, so um, the, the, the ranking is, um, is, is controlled by uh, that OLAP specification. And this is pretty powerful. Um, we actually have um, three built-in functions uh, that um, are, work more like your traditional or scalar functions that, ex that, that take this OLAP specification. And I think we'll see all three of them uh, in the next few seconds here. Um, here we've got a, a dense rank and uh, the dense rank works very similar to the rank. In this case, you see the OLAP specification does not have a partition by. We're just saying order by salary descending. So we're ranking everybody regardless of their department, right? And the highest salaries will be at the top. Now, um, what you may have noticed on the rank function, let's actually go back to the rank function a second. We had a tie for number one here, right? Employees Haas and Moon both had the same salary and they were number one and what the rank function does is it gives them both the number one right we don't break the tie um, but then we skip number two right there is no number two because we had a tie at number one uh, the dense rank function uh, we still have that tie at number one right but when we use the dense rank function it works exactly like rank except we, we don't skip you know, we, we fill the holes, right? So uh, Lucchesi uh, at 46.5 is number two, where if we had used the rank function, he would have been number three. Um, another way to think about this is, <clears throat> you know, rank is more ranking the rows, where dense rank is ranking the values, <clears throat> right? So we could accurately say here, um, these both these statements would be true, I think. Lucchesi is the third highest paid employee and he has the second highest value for salary 
right? And which of those two questions you're trying to answer will determine whether you want to use rank or dense rank, okay? We've also showed you an example of using the, the over in a couple of different ways. Are we ranking everybody, you know, uh, one through however many we have, or are we breaking at, uh, are we ranking people within department? Okay. Uh, row number works like rank and dense rank, um, except that uh, for ties with row number, uh, we are not going to duplicate any numbers. So our highest two paid employees there, we still have that tie at number one, and the row number function will just give them you know, one and two. Uh, and you really can't control <laughs> which one of those guys is number one and which one of them is number two. Okay. So those are the three uh, OLAP functions, and they all expect this OLAP specification um, in the over clause that tells us how the ranking or numbering is supposed to work. Okay. Um, here is an example of row number where we are breaking the ties explicitly now, right? So that, that order by, uh, instead of just ordering by salary descending, we're saying order by salary descending and bonus descending, right? So if we have a tie at salary, so Haas and Moon are, <clears throat> both have the same salary, well then who shows up, you know, how do we break the tie? Well, we're gonna look at the bonus, right? We could still have ties, um, but we're less likely to if, you know, the more criteria you add there, right? Now, one other thing that uh, we should talk about here is the order by in that OLAP specification is different than the final order by uh, that you have at the bottom there. So order by salary descending and bonus descending, well, it, I say it's different. We, we made it the same. Right? So that the order that I get coming out of the, um, in the final result matches the ranking or row numbering in this case that I did. Um, but we don't have to do that. Right? In fact, uh, you could specify a different order by uh, as the final order by. And um, don't have an example of this here, but... Uh, um, you know, if you, the, so the, the first order by, the one on the third line there, controls how the ranking or row numbering in this case is going to work. And the final order by, you know, controls the order of the final result. So we could actually say in that final order by, order by last name, right? And then the last names that start with A would be at the top, but the ranking, you know, the, the ranking of the first row that we saw might be, you know, 57. Right, it, it depends on, uh, the, you know, the ranking you're going to see is going to depend on the order by that's in the OLAP specification. Um, it usually, I think, makes sense if you're ranking things to actually want to see them come out in the same order <laughs> as the ranking. So it makes sense very often for the final order by to match the order by and the over. Um, I'm going back to the very first slide here or the first example, if you're partitioning, then you would lead with the partitioning columns in your order by, right? So I'm partitioning by department number and then within department, I'm ordering by salary descending. The final order by here makes sense as shown here that I would order by the partitioning columns first and then the, um, the order by columns in the same sequence, okay? And that makes the result that you're looking at make sense. Um, the point here, I guess, is a lot of people are tempted to leave that final order by off. And very often you'll see them kind of come out in the order that you would expect, but it's not guaranteed, right? In, in SQL, one of the concepts that I, you know, keep trying to hammer into people when I teach SQL is that your the order of your final result is never guaranteed unless you specify an order by clause. You know, you may see it come out in a particular order 99 times out of 100, but and if there's no guarantee of that final order unless you ask for it. And the order by that's in the OLAP specification here does not guarantee the order of your final result. It only guarantees the order um, of your ranking in this case. 
So those are those three functions. These are commonly referred to as the OLAP functions, rank, dense rank, and row number. What we're going to do is kind of take what we talked about there and now apply it to the uh, regular um, uh, aggregate functions. Right, so the, the, regular, the aggregate functions, I say there are five of them, sum, min, max, average, and count. We've left count out of this discussion because I can't think of a really great use case for any of what we're gonna talk about with the count function. And there are actually other aggregate functions as well. Um, there's standard deviation and variance and all kinds of statistical things. Um, I kind of focus the conversation on these functions because these are the ones that we use a lot. All right, min, give me the smallest value in a, in a set. Max, give me the biggest value in a set. Sum, add up the numbers. Average, average the numbers. These are the ones we sort of use on a, on a regular basis. Um, and so what we're going to do is learn to apply that OLAP specification um, to these aggregate functions to do some pretty cool stuff. Um, so here's kind of a basic use case. Right, I'm taking really a lot of the same data that we were looking at before, and uh, I'm giving a list of employee number, department, and salary, and then everything in the red there on the second and third line is one column in the result set, that final column in the result set. Sum of salaries, and then I've got an OLAP specification over order by salary ascending. <clears throat> now, um, if you haven't seen this before, you might be a little bit concerned about the fact that we're mixing that sum with other columns from the result. And one of the first things I learned anyway when I was learning SQL about aggregate functions is you can't mix a sum function, an aggregate function, with employee number, department number, and salary without grouping by all of the non-column function things or the non-aggregate function things. In other words, the sum is meant to be applied to a group of values and then you're, you, you can't then go select detail values like employee number. Okay. Um, so this is gonna be an exception to that. If you apply an OLAP specification to this, it's gonna change the nature of that sum. You're saying uh, sum of salaries over order by salary ascending. And again, the order by in my final result here should probably match that. And look at what I get here. Um, there is actually some default uh, syntax here that is that I'm not showing, but uh, is being taken by default. You could modify that order by order by salary ascending rows unbounded preceding is what's defaulting there. And what you're getting here is a running total. Okay. Running total says um, keep adding the new value to everything previous. So the first row, the sum of salaries, you know, the person's salary is 15,340 and the sum is 15,340. Second person's salary is 15,9 and now my running total is up to 31,240. So what you're getting here in that right hand column is a running total. Every person's salary is being added to the, to the total. Okay, um, so sometimes people refer to this as a moving aggregate, right? You can create a window around the row that you're looking at. In our case, we're going back to the beginning and, and get a, a moving or um, uh, sometimes this is called windowing uh, aggregate, okay? Here now we're adding the partition by. So partition by department number, order by salary ascending. So now I'm gonna get a running total that is partitioned by the department number. So there's four people that work in department A00. <clears throat> there are their salaries and we get a running total. You see those first four rows, we get a running total for the people who work in department A00. And then when we have a break on department, uh, the sum starts over, right? Because of that partition by. 
So you get the same OLAP specifications that you got when you were doing ranking and row numbering and things. You can apply those same OLAP specifications to the, um, the uh, aggregate functions. Again, your order by should probably match, right? The partitioning columns first and then the um, order by columns should be in the final order by in that order if you want the result to kind of make sense uh, to humans anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, so that uh, <laughs> we've got some arrows there to show uh, really what, uh, what that should look like, right? Department number, the partitioning column is first and then any order by columns uh, would follow. Um, here we're adding some modification to this, right? So um, we're doing a select with an average now, right? Instead of a sum, and that works just as well. I'm saying over partition by department number, order by salary ascending, that part we've seen so far, rows two preceding, uh, rows between actually, that should say, rows between two preceding, and current row. Um, rows between two preceding and current row. What that's saying is the window that I'm working with only goes back two rows. So don't average everything back to the beginning. Average the value that I'm working with along with the, the two rows that precede it. Okay, so that's why you sometimes hear this referred to as a moving aggregate or a windowed aggregate. By default, it's going to average everything up to this point, right? all the rows up to this point. But you actually have a bunch of control over that, uh, that window. Rows two preceding and current row. So we could say um, rows between two preceding and two following. So in other words, average this row with the two before it and the two after it. You have a lot of control over that window. Um, you know, so the, the use cases for this are probably a little less frequent, uh, especially with things like sum and average. Okay, um, and I give you a link there to uh, an, an IDUG uh, uh, blog that covers that in a little more detail. Um, range between, uh, so that that's a this is one that I have even uh, more trouble finding use cases for. Although uh, I was at an insurance company a couple months ago where they said they had some they could think of some practical uses in their application. But if I say range between, uh, I'm not talking about number of rows back or forward. I'm talking about number of values. So here I'm doing a dollar amount, right? I'm summing up salaries. And if I say range between 5,000 preceding and current row, what that's gonna do is go back $5,000. So my window is established by the range of values. So uh, if you look at the row in red there, uh, or the last row in red at the bottom of the window, that person's salary is 20,450. That range goes back to, um, uh, everything but the first row, right? Because it's actually looking at $20,000 in our case or uh, whatever your currency is, right? And uh, 15.9 is the smallest value that still fits in that window, okay? So you, again, you got lots of control over how you define this window, right? And so the average, the, the average there uh, in the last column uh, will be calculated based on that OLAP specification that you put in. Okay. Um, got a short case study to kind of wrap this up and uh, this is gonna be a shorter webinar, but uh, hopefully this is just something real practical that you can take back and, and use. Uh, this was at a client that I was at very recently. <clears throat> they had data that looked something like this. Um, the, uh, at, on the top uh, grid there. We have a customer ID, right? So I'm showing you two customers worth of data. They have a start date and then they have some data, okay? 
And, and essentially the, the business case for this or the business use for this was um, customer number one, that important data off to the right there was valid beginning on January 1st of 2017. And then it stops being valid or stops being effective whenever the next row starts being effective. So essentially we could say that that first row is effective for customer number one from January 1 of 2017 until January 1 of 2018. Okay. So there's a window of time that starts on the start date and it ends whenever the next row's start date is. And they had a need to get the data back in a result that looks like what's on the bottom there. In other words, I want to reach down onto that next row and pull its start date up as the end date of this row. Okay, so uh, for customer number two there, you see, uh, right, they have a row that's effective from January 1 of 2017 until uh, April 10th of 2017. And then uh, that row is effective all the way until January 1 of 2019. And then we don't have one after that. And what we'd like to see there is, you know, a null value, which we could of course use the coalesce function to turn into something real if we wanted to, right? And so this is the way to do it. Um, we have two functions in SQL called lead and lag. And if you're a uh, DB2 for mainframe person, these functions don't yet exist on DB2 for ZOS, but I'm going to show you how to do it, how to simulate this behavior in just a second. Um, <clears throat> side note for DB2 mainframe people, if uh, they did implement um, recently these two functions as a pass through for the analytics accelerator, if that's what you're using, uh, but for native DB2 ZOS, these two functions do not exist yet. For everybody else, including DB2 on other platforms, these do exist, okay? Um, so the lead function, you see that OLAP specification, right? Partition by customer ID, order by start date ascending. The lead function says, go grab this value, the value in this column, start date, from the next row based on that OLAP specification. <clears throat> so this is pretty straightforward, right? Just go grab the next row start date, and that's my end date. And if you wanted to get fancy here, you could break out your date functions, right, and subtract a day from it. Um, if you were doing a through date, I, I was told recently, at least in some shops, we have the concept of a through date versus a to date. And really all that matters there is, is that final date inclusive or not inclusive? So in this example, we're sort of in, in um, assuming that that end date is not inclusive, but we could subtract a day from it using functions if we wanted to, right? So reach down into the next row and grab the start date. And that'll be my end date, right? So all that stuff in red there is the end date column that you saw on the previous page. So the end date of the first row here, right? January 1st of 2017 is the start date. We're gonna reach down and grab the next start date January 1 of 2018, and that's my end date, and the lead function does that for me, okay? Um, there's a note here, the lag function does exactly the same thing, it just grabs the, the value from the previous row. So lead and lag, just give me the next value or the previous value. Now, if you're on DB2 for ZOS, we don't have these two functions. Uh, I assume they're coming fairly soon, um, but right now we don't have them. And so the way um, that uh, we simulate this behavior on mainframe DB2 is by using a regular aggregate function like minimum. Uh, you could pretty easily do this with minimum or maximum, right? The, the OLAP specification is almost the same, partition by customer ID, order by start date ascending, rows between now I'm gonna, so I'm gonna do, take the minimum value from a range of rows, but all I have to do now is, is limit the range to the one preceding, or the one following row, excuse me, rows between one following and one following. In other words, the next row, right? So take the minimum value from the next row. Well, I have to use an aggregate function there, right? 
Um, so I'm using something like min or max, which will just give you a single value. Um, and I'm just limiting the, the result or the, the window to a single row, the one immediately following the one I'm positioned on. Okay, so this OLAP specification on the minimum function gives you exactly the same results as the lead function gives you on other platforms. If you have the lead function, if you're working on Oracle or SQL Server or DB2LUW, you would use the lead function. Uh, but if you don't have it, this is a way that will get you the same answer, um, you know, just a, uh, one extra line of typing uh, to establish the range for the min function. Uh, if you wanted to simulate the lag function, you would do exactly the same thing here. You would just say rows between one preceding and one preceding. Right, to pull a row, a value down from uh, the previous row. Right. As I said before, the order by the final order by there should uh, usually mirror the OLAP specification: partitioning columns first, and then order by columns. Okay. Uh, so that is what I had for you today. Um, hopefully, this has been uh, a useful little bit of information. Um, if you are um, uh, some of the platforms that uh, we've discussed, this is relatively new. If you're a DB2 person, I think this came somewhere around version 10. So, you know, <clears throat> the last uh, seven or eight years, this has been available. But uh, um, I find when I teach SQL, this is not a, a feature that uh, everyone knows about. So uh, hopefully this has been helpful. You can feel free to email me if you have any questions or comments uh, about what we talked about today. Again, if you'd like the slides for this webinar or the replay later on, you can go out to themasync.com slash webinars or just themasync.com and select the webinars tab from the top and uh, the slides are, are available for you there. Uh, feel free to stay in touch with me if you'd like. The email address is there or uh, any of the social media platforms where you can find me uh, is great. And I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks for attending.